a lot of you are gonna be mad at us. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lodge. This channel started off talking about national parks, people that went missing in them, and the monsters that may have taken them. Since then, we've looked into a lot of cases and found that, you know what, for the most part, this really just was negligence or some sort of freak accident, and sometimes it was some form of crime. And occasionally there is one that does feel like it really must be paranormal. Like, there's just no way that this person could have just dropped off the face of the earth without a trace. And then sometimes it is monsters, but a different sort of monster. Monster. In 1958, Bobby Beesup, a 10-year-old from Denver, Colorado, was the victim of several priests at Camp St. Mallow on Mount Meeker in Colorado. Joseph Augustus Zarelli was sold by his parents in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, suffered for two years, and then was unceremoniously dumped on the side of the road in a box. He was just four years old. I've seen some pretty horrible stories on this job. Children being harmed, cults with mass rituals of self-deletion, and even cases of police just simply refusing to investigate the disappearance of native women. But of all of it, the worst is absolutely when I have to tell you guys a story about a child who met an unfortunate end. So you can imagine that when I heard there was a movie coming out, an action movie, about a true story of a man and his organization who went undercover deep into the wilderness to go and rescue children from trafficking, I was... there, there were so many emotions, everything from anger that it took this long to relief that somebody was finally talking about a massive problem. You know, I thought, finally, this is a problem that is being recognized and is being brought to the big screen. I felt the same way about Wind River in 2017. Now, obviously not at the time, but now I truly, truly believe that film is so important, despite the fact that it's only loosely based on a true story. Most of the stuff in that film is creative license, is narrative choices meant to present a more interesting series of events to the viewer so that you can fit it all into an hour and a half or two hours. You know, finally I thought, this is, this is making it to the big screen, there will be change, there will be awareness. But then I learned some more things about the movie. It was slated for release in 2020, but it was owned by Fox at that point. And then when Disney and Fox merged, when Disney acquired the smaller company, they put it on the shelf. So, thinking about Jeffrey Epstein and all the things he did and all the people he helped do things and the fact that he very much did not himself, I, th I thought, you know, it, it rang some alarm bells. Why is this massive company that has a finished movie about child trafficking keeping it on a shelf? Why do they not want people seeing this film? I had my opinions, you know, I, I thought maybe, maybe there's something nefarious going on here, maybe there's something that people in Hollywood want to hide. Obviously there's a ton of stories from people like Corey Feldman, and you see people who got in big trouble like Kevin Spacey. So, you know, maybe, maybe there was something bigger at play here, right? But I wasn't just gonna sit there and be conspiratorial. There were people saying things about the movie, and so I decided to go and see the movie. And I walked out of that theater even more certain that Disney was up to something. So so I was rather shocked to see so many normal people, both in my real life and on the internet, railing against the child trafficking movie that I just saw. Because when I went in, I was like, this is, there's nothing, there's nothing about this that off the cuff, just watching the movie as an outsider, feels off to me. Some of the numbers felt a little wonky. I was like, really? One to two million? But I, I, for the most part, I watched the film and I was like, there's really, there's nothing controversial in here. Everybody should be able to get behind the message, child trafficking bad. And most of the outlets I was seeing were leading by calling it some sort of QAnon conspiracy movie. Reporters were saying that it was politically motivated, that it was full of anti-Semitic dog whistles, and one writer even called it a paranoid fantasy. Having seen it, I saw none of that. No QAnon, no paranoid fantasy, no conspiracy theory, no politics. So I dug my heels in even more and said, there's something wrong with with the the arguments against this movie. I don't like it, I don't trust it. That meant a video on TikTok that got one and a half million views and a video on Instagram that got half a million views. Identical video, two different platforms. I've never had an Instagram video do that well before. But the thing is, that got it kind of out of the echo chamber of people who saw Sound of Freedom and saw nothing wrong with Sound of Freedom and people who maybe knew a little bit more about the specifics of international trafficking than I did. And from them, I heard a different reason to dislike the movie, to discourage people from seeing it. And that was that Operation Underground Railroad and Tim Ballard, the guy who founded it, weren't effective and that sometimes, in fact, they were worse than ineffective, they were harmful. People were all over my comment sections telling me that activists, organizations, experts were all speaking out against Tim Ballard saying that 
th there was one unified message, really. Tim Ballard's tactics are not effective, and they sometimes traumatize victims. When I tried to find a video that went over the whole thing fairly, all I saw was either entirely pro-Ballard and OUR, or entirely anti-Ballard and OUR. There was no middle ground. It was just, this is either, you know, Jesus Christ reincarnated, or this is the evil worst people in the world. But I am well aware, working a job like this, that nothing in the world is black and white. So I decided if there's nobody else doing this, I'm gonna do it. And for that reason, I wanna preface this video before we start getting into the details about the film and Tim Ballard, Operation Underground Railroad, the allegations against them, all of that, that I'm not doing this for political purposes. Nobody paid us to make this video. This is not us trying to uh, stand up for one side or the other. What we really want to do with this video is tell you the story that is in Sound of Freedom, the story as Tim Ballard claims it actually happened, because the movie takes a lot of creative license, the allegations about some of the exaggerations or even lies that Operation Underground Railroad has supposedly told you. We're gonna go over the QAnon allegations and explain briefly what QAnon even is. And then finally, at the end of the video, there's gonna be a bit about what you can actually do, who you can t donate to, what the statistics you need to understand are. It is not our intention to get you to like Sound of Freedom, like Tim Ballard, and like Operation Underground Railroad. It is also not our intention to get you to dislike these people, rail against them, and, and not see the movie. All we want to do is provide you with the facts about this entire thing as it stands right now in the most unbiased way possible. It is not intended to lionize or demonize Tim Ballard, simply to equip you with the tools that you need to form an opinion and to help engage yourself in the actual fight against what is one of the largest criminal industries in the world. No matter your religion, gender, nationality, political affiliation, we want you to come away from this video with an understanding of the truth so that we can all work together to end child sex trafficking. So at this point in the video, we're going to explain to you the plot of Sound of Freedom, what happens in the movie, so obviously there will be spoilers. I'm going to explain the entire plot of the film, so that I can explain where the film made things up or changed things around. In fact, to be honest, this, this video is almost entirely gonna be spoilers for Sound of Freedom, so if you haven't seen it yet and you intend to, I, I would recommend going and seeing it first and then coming back to watch this video. But at, at least like watch it, you know, at least hit the like button first so that it gets in the algorithm. Thank you. The story of Sound of Freedom begins in the capital city of Honduras, which I wanted to try and pronounce, but I think it's better if I don't. Roberto Aguilar is approached by a very attractive young woman at his home who says that she saw his daughter singing in the street and performing and she really thinks that she could be a very talented young actress or model, something like that. And of course this is all in Spanish. And so she, she recruits the daughter, Rosia. And of course around this time, uh, their son, Miguel, he comes around the corner and she's like, oh, who's this? He's adorable. And she's like, why don't I take both your kids to the photo shoot and we'll, we'll, get, we'll make them both big stars. He takes the kids to an empty apartment where there's a bunch of other kids and photo shoots going on and they're posing the children. And at, in the audience, you're sitting there and you, you, can, you know what's going on as an audience member. You understand why the children are being, the children don't know why they're being posed in a certain way, why they're told to put lipstick on, toss their hair over one shoulder, but you know. And all the while, you also know that they're not making it out of that apartment, at least not with their dad. When Roberto returns to the apartment later that evening to pick up his kids, it's, it's gone, there's nobody there. It's dark, all the children have been taken. And through the context that uh, Alejandro Monteverde, the guy who wrote the movie, and uh, Eduardo Verstegui, I believe is how you pronounce his name, they, they really crafted a, a very hard-hitting narrative at the beginning of this film where the, the situational irony for you as the audience member, you understand what's going on, and it's not irony in the funny sense. It, it's, you know what's going on, nobody in the film does, and it really just, it guts you. Because the implication is that these, these children have been taken to be sold uh, as sex slaves. From there, we make a pretty big jump. We go to the United States, where Special Agent Tim Ballard with the Department of Homeland Security is getting ready to bust a pedophile. He and his partner succeed in capturing a guy the movie names as Ernst Oshinsky. But despite the fact that they have succeeded to capture this pedophile, to stop him from transmitting all of the images that he just sold to his website and all of that, Ballard's partner isn't super happy. He's a little deflated about the whole thing. He asked Tim, how many pedophiles have we caught? And I can't remember the exact number Tim gives, but I think it's a couple hundred. There's a little pause, and then his partner asks, how many kids have we saved? 
the unfortunate answer to that question because of the nature of how these crimes work and the complicated law enforcement process of international trafficking and international sale of images, the answer is zero. They, they haven't saved any kids. And that lights a fire in Tim and gets him, you know, on, on the track of, I, I don't just want to capture and punish the bad guys, I want to save the kids. So he takes a bit of a different angle. He asks for a week. He says, you know, can you give me a week with this guy before we nail him? He spends that week convincing Oshinsky that he too, Tim Ballard, is a pedophile. And not only does he absolutely admire Oshinsky's work, but also he wants Oshinsky's help in setting up the real deal. In exchange, he's gonna help Oshinsky get off. He's gonna make sure that he gets the lightest possible sentence. Anytime that there's any inkling that he might get in trouble, Ballard's gonna be there to somehow dismiss it. And through Oshinsky, he manages to arrange to meet with a child. Oshinsky slides across, you know, a book with a picture of the kid in it. And we get this really satisfying moment where Tim Ballard opens the book, sees the picture of the kid, and tells Oshinsky he's under arrest. And there's sirens outside, and there's other agents all over the restaurant they're in. It's this really triumphant moment. You're like, finally, finally we got him. Now, the boy that Tim purchased for this is, is named Teddy Bear, according to the traffickers. This is all happening around Calexico, California, so we're down near the border. Kids coming from Mexico. Tim goes down, he goes to the border checkpoint. A guy named Earl Buchanan is in a van bringing a young boy across the border. They stop him, this is who they're looking for. He goes around, he asks the boy what his name is. It's Teddy Bear, they arrest Buchanan. Tim takes Teddy Bear, real name Miguel Aguilar, to get a burger and they sit and they talk. And of course that's not something that would happen in real life, but it's a movie. They sit and they talk, he has some food, and Miguel tells the story of what happened to him. And Tim's just kind of pushing and prodding and all that and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on here. And Miguel tells him about his sister. Or at least in the words of a seven-year-old boy who has been horribly, horribly mistreated, he tells Tim's character that, uh, that, that he, he tells him about the abuse and the, the captivity and that his sister is still missing. T Tim promises that he's going to go get the sister. He also gives Tim a necklace that is uh, dedicated to Saint Timothy, one of the earliest Christian saints, and he says that his sister Rosia gave it to him. Miguel is returned to his father Roberto, but in seeing the grief on Miguel's father's face, Tim's like, I really got to find that girl because he's, he's even asked, what if it was one of your kids? And Tim had six of them. His search takes him to Cartagena, Colombia, which a 2014 CBS article referred to as a destination for tourists looking to abuse boys and girls. There, he teams up with a man named Vampiro, who is an ex-cartel accountant who now uses his money to help save kids. They meet up and there's, there's kind of some tense moments where they're feeling each other out and Vampiro asks Tim, why are you doing this? What, what does this mean to you? And Tim looks him in the eye after pausing for a moment and says, God's children are not for sale. Now, of course, in real life, Tim Ballard is a, he's a Mormon. He believes in God. He's a religious man. This is not a super surprising thing for anybody to say. And for those who might not be religious and might see this as kind of a weird, you know, only God's children, God's children as a term here applies to all children. The, the idea is God is the father of all humanity, therefore all of God's, all the children are God's children. It's really not supposed to be like a specific only the Christian kids kind of thing. So they hatch a plan after Tim mentions that there was a resort in Thailand that got busted for trafficking very, very young models to its guests. And they organize a sting in which they gather up a bunch of different traffickers because they want to get as many kids out as possible. And they say, we're starting a resort on a private island and we need, we need talent. We want as much talent as we can get and we want that talent to be very young, if you catch my drift. And the whole purpose of this resort will be for wealthy tourists, mostly from first world countries and wealthier people from Latin America and Asia to come and, and mistreat children. Vampiro and Ballard himself managed to secure the help of a Latin American billionaire who just enjoys helping and trafficking because he has the money to, which honestly, you know what? We need more of that in the world. And that guy supplies the funding for the mission, but then Tim gets an unfortunate call from his boss, Frost, back at DHS, who tells him, you gotta, you gotta call this off and come home. It's too much money, it's too much time off the books, I can't explain what's happening, I cannot, I cannot keep you there. So Tim calls his wife and he's like, I don't know what to do here. I'm, I'm lost, you know, 
I, I need to save these kids, but they want me to quit my job, but we have the family, but I really need to stay here and save these kids. And his wife kind of tells him, you know, you're, you're doing the right thing, do what you have to do. It's okay with me if you quit your job. Something I found out after finishing the research for this was that that conversation went a little differently in real life, as in, Tim was basically hoping his wife would give him a way out, and his wife told him he was doing it. She was like, no, you're, you're staying there and you're saving those kids. And Tim says that he, you know, the, the movie didn't, they didn't want to make him look like a coward, but in that moment, he was a coward. So Ballard resigns and they team up with a Colombian police officer named Jorge who is going to help them set up the sting, who's going to help them, you know, make sure that they're doing this the right way because he understands the trafficking underground and how the law enforcement response works better than Ballard, who of course is from the United States. In addition, Tim's boss, Frost, is able to actually get in contact with the Colombian embassy and help set up the sting so that it will also include the Colombian Navy and Coast Guard. They set up the sting, they get the traffickers to the island, they get the kids to the island, and there's at one point a really tense moment where one of the traffickers wants one of the kids for himself right then and there, and Tim's like, no, uh, he's mine. And there's a gun held to Tim's head and a whole moment where it looks like this whole operation might be blown, and Tim has to make the very difficult decision to say, you know what, yeah, you can you can have the boy because they're they're gonna save all these kids anyway. Another thing I found out upon uh, upon finishing my research and listening to some more interviews with Tim Ballard is that that did not happen in real life. That moment was never there. The kids were never remotely close enough to the traffickers for anything to happen. So in the movie, very intense moment, very heroic, very you know gut wrenching. By the end of it, didn't actually happen. Was was necessary for the movie to have the gravity that that they wanted it to have. By the time the sting is completed, they've arrested all of the traffickers and rescued 54 children, but among them is not Rosia. During interrogations from one of the traffickers, the cops and Tim learn that Rosia has actually been sold off already full time to a Colombian rebel warlord in the jungle. It is never said what the ideology of the rebels is, nor is it at any point implied. I will tell you right now, and this is one of the reasons that I was so confused when people called the movie political, that the rebels are, are communists, and it would have been a very easy way to attack communists if they had done that in the movie, but instead they decided to avoid politics in that scene. Given the situation, the fact that this is rebel territory, there are barely even roads into it, and the Colombian police and military don't go there because it's too dangerous, Jorge says that there's, there's no chance of getting Rosia. They, they can't do it. They cannot go in there and get her. There's no way that's happening. Tim is not deterred and decides, you know what, I'm gonna do it anyway. He and Vampiro hatch another plan, and this time, they're gonna go in as UN doctors bringing vaccines so they can go treat some sort of epidemic, they can test for it and make sure that, you know what, we, we're helping, we're helping you guys, there's nothing, nothing mysterious here. But they encounter a rebel patrol who tell them only Tim's allowed to go. They can only bring one person and they decide it's going to be Tim. At the camp, he discovers that a rebel warlord by the name of the Scorpion has been running a cocaine manufactory deep inside the forest. And he sees the Rosia standing there mashing coca leaves with her feet and learns that she has been sold to the Scorpion as his personal slave. Tim manages to wait until nightfall and eventually is able to locate her but when he wakes her up to try and get her to come with him to leave, she screams, which alerts the scorpion who comes back and then uh, Tim has to hide and the scorpion goes to do some very evil things at which point Tim is forced to kill him. If I'm being perfectly honest, watching someone strangle a pedophile was was pretty satisfying. Now, of course, just in case it wasn't clear, we all know why Rosia screamed upon seeing a man wake her up. So I don't feel bad watching the scorpion die. Tim manages to take Rosia, get out of there, steal a boat, get down the river, and then rendezvous with Vampiro and Jorge, at which point they book it out of there while being shot at. Rosia is returned to her family, and Tim goes home to his. The film then has an epilogue that goes on to tell a little bit more of Tim's story, talk in a little bit more detail about Operation Underground Railroad, Operation Triple Take, which was what this, this specific sting was called, and showing footage of the sting, of the kids who were rescued, of the traffickers who were arrested. It also goes on to not just target that specific form of slavery, but human trafficking as a whole, whether it's adults, children, labor, other things. The claim is made that more people are enslaved today than were enslaved when slavery was legal, and that one or two million children are trafficked every year. That is, of course, a global number. The film's cast included Passion of the Christ's Jim Caviezel, 
Joker's Bill Camp, Supernatural's Kurt Fuller, as well as Mighty Aphrodite's Mira Sorvino. So we've got Academy Award winning actors here. The film was written by Alejandro Monteverde and Rob Barr, with Monteverde being the one directing it and Verastegui being the one who was producing it. And of course, Monteverde and Verastegui, they are both award winning Latin American producers, filmmakers, actors. As of July 18th, 2022, the movie had grossed $85 million at the box office on a budget of just $14.5 million, so resounding financial success. And at the time of doing the research, we were sitting at a 73% on Rotten Tomatoes, and that was the tomato meter score, that was the critic score, as well as an audience score of 100%. Rotten Tomatoes describes the critical perspective of the film as Sound of Freedom is an effective and suspenseful call to action against human trafficking, yet not free of issues in the depiction of sensitive subject matter. So basically what they're saying is good movie, good cause, effective at communicating, but didn't quite do enough in certain circumstances to tell you important details. So that is the movie, that is Sound of Freedom. But what about Tim Ballard himself? What about the guy it's based on? Who is he, what did he actually do? But before we dive into criticisms of Ballard and OUR, we need to kind of go through what actually happened because like I said earlier in this video, the movie absolutely takes creative license. There are, there are a lot of liberties. There are a lot of things that had to come together to make this a coherent single narrative that you could sit through in a movie theater rather than like a docu-series. The film is, as it says at the very beginning, based on true events, but those events have been mixed and matched. The first bit to address here probably would be Tim's history as a Homeland Security agent, and specifically one who worked on child trafficking cases. Tim worked for 12 years for the Department of Homeland Security, specifically working on child trafficking and abuse cases, and before that he spent a year with the CIA, then 9-11 happened, they created the DHS, and he was shifted over there. And yes, the Department of Homeland Security is that new, and it is because of 9-11. In case you needed any more evidence that this video is not political for us, we're praising the federal government. I am sitting here telling you about a three-letter agency doing something good. At first, Tim's main job was pinching the consumers, getting them, and then watching through the material that they had so he could report it for court, which he says took a severe toll on his mental health, because when you think about what that means, it, I, I don't know how anybody could could possibly do that and keep their sanity. He describes having to document materials involving children as young as five to seven years old on average. And he says that this was really difficult for him because he couldn't do anything to help these kids. He could only punish the people who hurt them. But in 2006, a new law passed. And this law was a, a actually a sweeping addressment of the problems with child and human trafficking and how can the US government update its policy to better fight this. Part of what it did was it allowed US agents to go into foreign countries to catch Americans who were preying on children elsewhere and treat them as if they had committed their crimes on US soil. So the United States, which has extremely strict laws that will, will very much get you if you're caught, it essentially made it so that people could no longer just seek going outside of the US to avoid punishment. The United States has very strict laws, very severe punishments. Used to be you could go to Colombia or Thailand or something like that where they have much less, where they have laxer laws and get away with it. Now you can't do that. If an American agency finds out you're doing that, they can go get you and they can punish you. But he says that even with this law, it still kind of hamstrung him a little bit in some cases. There were issues with flexibility, money, how much time could be spent on these issues. And of course, if they couldn't find an American doing the crime, they couldn't do anything about the crime. This meant that there were a few cases where, despite the fact that he could have rescued the kid, he had to leave him behind, or at least according to him. So Tim's history, what led up to him deciding to leave DHS and found underground freedom, that's how he portrays it. That's what he says about it. And from what I can tell, that, that all seems to be true. I didn't find any anything that disputed that part. Additionally, I did find court documents and records from various seizures that mention special agent or ICE agent Tim Ballard going back to at least 2006. The next one up is Earl Buchanan because a lot of the critiques I saw focused on this story. Earl Buchanan is a real person, he is a real pedophile, he was really arrested at the Mexican border with a, a young boy who in real life was younger, he was five, this is the boy Miguel was based on, he was actually five in real life, not seven, and they decided, you know what, that's too dark. And he was arrested for possession of child pornography as well as sexual exploitation of a child. 
Tim says that Buchanan was transporting miners across the border and that his team received a tip about this. He also at one point in an interview said that at some point the kid like jumped up and hugged him. And from what I can tell in one of the earlier interviews, it seems like he was saying that the boy jumped out of the van and hugged him. But I, I will admit there, there are some problems with the details here. In one interview, Tim did seem to imply that he was there when the boy was was rescued, like when they made the stop and that he was involved in the stop and the boy jumped out of the truck, out of the van and hugged him and all of that. It does not seem that that is necessarily the case and in listening to some of Tim's more recent interviews, he's changed the story a little bit and it now matches the official case report more. But he says that the boy jumped out of the van, grabbed on him and said, I don't belong here in English. And Tim then says that he learned that, you know what, he had, he had learned English because he had been taken as an infant. But there are people who have criticized that story and pointed out some inaccuracies. One of those is Damian Moore over at American Crime Journal, who I, in the original version of these notes for this video, I was extremely critical of him. I was very hard on him. I had a, a back and forth with him on Twitter that resulted in me deciding that, you know what? I, I feel like I disagree with his analysis, but at the same time, he seems to want the same thing that I do, which is to end this problem. So I'm, I'm gonna step back. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go in quite as much as I originally was going to on that article, but I am gonna point out where the article got things wrong as well as where Tim seems to have either misremembered or or fabricated something. I don't want to assume, I don't want to assign motive to him. It, it could just be that in his mind, his memories have been mixed up. As we all know, memory is malleable. But Damian Moore writes that Tim Ballard was actually not on scene when the van pulled up. He was not there for the child to jump out of the van and jump into his arms, that didn't happen. And the case report supports that because it was around 1630 hours when the van actually pulled up. And these reports say that Special Agent Ballard was on scene to collect videotapes and you know interview witnesses and all of that on, at around 1830 hours. So he was there two hours later because he had to make it down from Calexico. Now, one thing I took issue with American Crime Journal, Damian Moore's article, was that it portrays uh, Buchanan as just being a pedophile and a family friend. It was actually that they were, he was taking the boy to Mexico, not from Mexico to the US, to visit the boy's father. And it's true that Buchanan was a family friend of this boy who is referred to by a number of different names throughout. I'm not gonna use one, we'll just, I, I, Pedro is one of the names that's used. So we'll go with that one. So he knew Pedro's family and they even called Pedro's grandmother and she said, yeah, he's, he's with my friend Earl and he's driving him down to see his dad. So that taken as an infant thing, not quite right. Again, I don't know if Ballard was misremembering, if he was mixing this up with another case. I don't want to assume th that people were lying. But objectively, what Tim said in an interview from uh, a few years ago was not true. The problem I took with the ACJ article was not that it was calling Tim out for, for telling mistruths, but rather that it did, a, it did slightly downplay Buchanan's crimes in order to elevate Tim's exaggerations. Because Buchanan was not just a pedophile. He didn't just abuse one kid. The article says that he wasn't trafficking anybody. He, he was a pedophile and he had a kid in his possession. He was crossing a border, but he wasn't trafficking. This neglects the fact that Buchanan had priors for alien smuggling according, that is the exact terminology used in the report, by the way, which is the same report that is cited in that article. But the, the case report does say that he had a prior for alien smuggling and some other violations. There were actually a total of three tapes recovered from that car as well, one of which, at least one of which, I couldn't confirm that the other two did, but at least one of which had, uh, had CP on it. So after this arrest, they did some more investigating into Buchanan and what they found was he was actually responsible for a lot more than just that. He was eventually convicted of having 11 child victims between the ages of two and 15, one of whom he was caught in the act of taking across a border, even though he had permission from the parents. But again, I look at that and I look at all the other work that I've done and I know the limitations of law enforcement and the things that they can say, the things that they will say, the things they often choose not to say. So for me, I look at this and the fact that he wasn't convicted of trafficking that boy specifically, to me, I look at that and I say, this is a pedophile who has priors for alien smuggling, taking a child across a border. To me, maybe that doesn't, beyond a reasonable doubt in front of a jury, prove that this man was trafficking children. But as far as I'm concerned, not looking at the legal definitions, looking at it from a, a moral standpoint and, you know, just calling it what it is, he was trafficking that child. 
as far as I'm concerned, there was enough evidence there for me to make the assumption that he trafficked that kid, and in order for me to believe he wasn't trafficking that kid, I'm gonna need him to prove it to me. Thankfully, for all of his horrible, horrific, evil crimes that he will surely suffer a, an eternity for, uh, Buchanan is currently in prison. Now, of course, I would prefer if he were with our friend Chippy the Wood Chipper, but that's only my preference. With all of that said, the report does say that Tim got there two hours after the, the, the initial stop, so something about his version of the story is either condensed or something has been embellished. In the version of this story that Tim told on uh, the Tim Pool podcast, Timcast IRL, because I was going and looking for every possible interview I could find with this guy, and that one actually was really good. He, they, they really kind of like have him tell the whole story in detail. And in his version in that, this didn't happen, all of this stuff didn't happen at a burger joint. It didn't happen at a, at a border stop. He brought him back to a DHS facility and talked to him and he said that, uh, that the kid was quiet for a really long time. And then eventually, randomly, he, he got up and, and ran over and hugged Tim and started to talk. And it was like, you know, something, it was like something spurred him to go and talk, according to Tim. And again, this, some of this stuff, there is no way to prove or disprove it, aside from witness testimony, and there is no witness testimony. Now, as for the issue of Tim going to Columbia to look for Miguel's sister in the film, that, Tim says, did not happen, that both the boy that, they, that was rescued there, as well as his older sister, both lived in the U.S. Additionally, the arrest of Earl Venton Buchanan was in 2006, the movie moves that up to 2012-2013 so that it coincides with the events that did happen in 2013 in real life. And at the time, Ballard was actually working on two different cases. One of them was Operation Triple Take, The Sting in Columbia. The other one was a case up in Haiti where he was looking for a boy named Gardy Marty, who was an American citizen, but his family relocated back to Haiti. In reality, he was told to come home from this operation in Colombia, and he did choose to quit his job instead. Of course, in the movie, he's the one being strong and firm, and as I said earlier, his wife is the one who's like, you can do this, I believe in you, and in real life, it was that he was hoping his wife would say no because he was scared, he didn't want to possibly lose his livelihood and not be able to provide for his kids, and his wife was basically like, we've got eternity to worry about, and I believe the exact words he said that she said were, you will not jeopardize my salvation. In the movie, a Latin American billionaire is the one who funded the sting in Colombia, Operation Triple Take. In real life, and this one took me by surprise, it was Glenn Beck. It probably should be mentioned that the sting in the movie is portrayed as being considerably more expensive than the real life sting was. Like, at least four times as expensive. And it seems like they maybe bought the island instead of just renting it, which is, in real life, they rented an island, I believe. I believe that it was, rather than it being a, a resort, it was that they were inviting them to a party. So they, they scaled things up for the movie. As for going into the Colombian jungle and all of that, and Rocia, and of course, well, if, if Miguel, the character, was based on Pedro, who of course was American, then how could they go into Colombia? Ah, we're getting there, because you know what? That part was based off the search for Guardy Marty, and I have a little bit more detail on that coming up. But the reason that Guardy's case was brought into this was, again, just to tie the narrative together, because again, what they needed to do here was not only make a movie about child trafficking, but also make a movie that people wanted to sit through. That sting in Colombia, of course, as I just said, did happen, and it was a joint operation between the very newly formed Operation Underground Railroad, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Colombian Navy and Coast Guard. It was called Operation Triple Take. It actually took place in two places at once. They only show one of them in the movie, and they rescued 54 kids, all of whom were in the ages between 11 and 18. So technically some of these were adults, but they were 18 year old adults who had been trafficked for a while. So we're not like really, th this is not a, this is not a, well, some of them were adults situation. It's a, th these were kids. And one thing that broke my heart researching this is that uh, Tim said that while they were on the island, of course, all the kids had no idea that they were about to be rescued. They thought they were all about to undergo a horrific amount of abuse. So he says they basically got all the kids, gave them snacks and drinks and put them in one area while they took the traffickers elsewhere and worked out the deal while they waited for law enforcement to get there. But he says that one of the boys came up to him and asked him uh, if if they were gonna give him like cocaine or something to, to numb the pain because he was scared. He said that they always gave him something for the pain. Of those 54 kids, according to CBS, 29 of the 54 were under 18. 
so the rest of them were just 18. Of the traffickers themselves, Tim says they're all real people, but their names were changed for the story, and as far as I can tell, that seems to be true, or at least I can't find anything to the contrary. The reason that I'm inclined to believe that this is true is mostly because of one specific character, who in the movie I think is goes by the name Giselle, right, Aiden? Yes, Giselle. And she was a former uh, Miss Cartagena. He, she, was a, she was a former model, beauty pageant queen, all of that. And in the movie, that's how she's portrayed. And when I went and I looked at the news stories from when this event actually happened back in 2014, th that, that checked out. That is what happened. A very beautiful model went and helped abduct these kids. Her name was Kelly Johanna Suarez, and she is a real person. So it makes sense to me that all of these would be real people. And according to the Daily Beast, Kelly Suarez was a known person in Colombia who did this, who would organize fake photo shoots and fake modeling agency stuff so that she could bring kids in for trafficking purposes. And again, that is the Daily Beast. The Daily Beast also confirms that the operation did happen, that it was called Crystal 2 by the Colombians, and that it did involve U.S. Uh, immigration Customs Enforcement as well as the Colombian Navy and Coast Guard. In interviews, Tim has readily admitted that the part of the movie where he goes into the jungle to look for Rosia is not true. This is also on Angel Studios' website, and it's also on OUR's website. So they've been very forthcoming. Uh, the links will be in the description to both of those articles from those sources about what is fact and fiction in the movie. We're also gonna link a uh, fact and fiction in Hollywood article where I, I want you guys to understand that the point of this video really is not to paint you guys a picture. It's to give you guys information. So I'm gonna give you as many sources as I can. Um, they're all still open in tabs on my laptop. So I'm just gonna grab links and you'll be able to see any of these in the description. Again, we don't wanna tell you what the article said because we want you to listen to us. We want to give you a video where you can sit here and learn what the article said and then if you so choose, go and look at them yourselves because we, we're not gonna lie to you. But point is, that mission in, in Colombia in the jungle didn't happen, or at least it didn't happen the way it happens in the movie. That did happen, but it was in Haiti and they crossed over to the Dominican Republic and they did go into a camp and they did pose as doctors. They had actual doctors and nurses there who did render actual aid, give out actual medical supplies but the operation failed and it was criticized by a number of people for several reasons. Some people were criticizing this and this, this was the search for Guardy Marty who disappeared in 2009 and Tim says that he promised Guardy's father that he would keep looking for his kids, so he did. Um, but in this version, they went into a village in the Dominican Republic, they brought their doctors, they brought, some, they brought a camera crew along as well and some people on the jump team who were journalists who we'll, we'll get into it later, but they did not do the best job of preparing some of these people. But humantraffickingsearch.org does confirm that the event did happen, that people did pose as doctors but also that some of the methods here were not quite the best they could have been. One such example would be the fact that uh, his source for why they were looking at this village was a psychic medium from Utah. But the silver lining was that some people got medicine, so that's good. Bill Camp's character, Vampiro, is also real, but they made some changes to him. His story about why he started fighting against this was changed. Uh, in the movie, he says that he accidentally purchased the services of an underaged uh, lady of the night, and that when he realized, when he found out that she was 14 and not 25, he he felt sick and he wanted to end his own life and he was disgusted, but he says that God spoke to him and told him not to do this. Not like, you know, in his ear, God talked to him, but again, I realize as a Christian, it's a lot of this stuff makes sense to me innately and I'm trying to explain it as best I can to somebody who might not have been raised in that environment. But the idea of God speaking to you is not that you hear a voice in your head, it's that you see certain signs around you and you realize, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. You may not believe in it, and that's fine, but there are a lot of people who believe in it strongly, and for them it can be a very serious motivator. In the real version of things, uh, first of all, Vampiro in the in the story actually went to jail. In the in the movie, he didn't ever go to jail in real life. He he just stopped working for the cartel. Uh, but in real life, the woman was of age, but he found out that she was, either her daughter was being exploited or she was allowing her daughter to be exploited and her daughter was underage. And so that's what in real life drove him into, into helping with this issue. So that is, you know, what Tim said about most of the story. And that kind of covers all of it. I know it was a little all over the place, but those are the major points that Tim covers where he says that the movie differed from the truth. Now, of course, we weren't just gonna take Tim's word for it because that would not be fair 
fair. That would not be doing a balanced review of the sources. That would not be analyzing this. This would be, that would just be telling you, you know, hey, here's what he said happened. So what we did was I sat down and I read so many articles but I picked a couple main ones to look at and we went through the criticisms of the film. I will say most of the things that critics were attacking were things Ballard has addressed in some form or another, or that Operation Underground Railroad has addressed or that Angel Studios has addressed. I can see the argument that maybe the movie should have had a part in the epilogue that said, okay, here's, here's the things we changed or that there's a part at the end, if you see it in theaters where Jim Caviezel speaks directly to the audience, there was maybe a moment there where he could have said, also, here's the true story, here's what we changed, here's what we mixed and matched. I can see that there were other opportunities, but not within the main narrative of the film. And also, I mean, are something that I've been struggling with in, in trying to do this. And again, I'm really trying to not put my own opinions into it, but it does bother me a little bit. Like, I don't think anybody's going to see Oppenheimer, which is out right now, and going, you know, well, th these little things were wrong and nitpicked and, and tearing it apart for some reason. I, I don't think people do that with most movies that are based on a true story. And people have said, well, maybe the reason Disney didn't release it is because it says based on a true story and there were too many liberties. I mean, it's not Disney, but another very big movie company, Warner Brothers, had absolutely no problem releasing the entire Conjuring series, despite the fact that Ed and Lorraine Warren are pretty well-known frauds. Or at least Ed Warren. Lorraine actually might have been a psychic. If you're curious, we we do in fact have a video on, on some of the Ed and Lorraine Warren cases. We have one on the Annabelle doll, we have one on the Amityville case. And I believe Wendigoon also has a video on the Warrens if you want a more rounded outlook. Uh, ours focuses on those cases. But yeah, a lot of the criticisms were related to how the film portrays events. We've already covered that. We'll cover a few of those, but but for the most part, the criticisms I wanted to focus on were the ones that weren't about the movie, but were about Tim Ballard, Operation Underground Railroad, and some of these alleged QAnon connections. He was criticized by an anonymous member of that Haiti operation, the one that was looking for Guardy Marty, where he brought in a psychic to help look for bringing in a psychic. Operation Underground Railroad's response to that was that Janet, the psychic, had actually been referred to them by a law enforcement source who they said had success, she had successfully helped them in the past. For this section, I mostly used a Vice article as well as a number of others. I had a Washington Post article up actually that did a really good job of fact checking the film, which shocked me. But when Vice went to OUR with questions, OUR provided them with some statements and also a few links specifically regarding this whole psychic medium thing, which one was to a 1993 research paper that I was only able to access the abstract for, and the other one was a link to a Forbes article, which was a profile on a psychic who claimed to work with law enforcement. Personally, for me, I, I would not, that would not be enough for me if OUR were to give that to me. But I also don't trust Vice, so I went and I read the abstract myself. And it's a good thing I did because Vice did not accurately represent what the abstract said. The paper does refer to the use of psychics as controversial, but Vice left out the rest of the line. That line says, but psychics have long been and will continue to be involved in unsolved criminal investigations. Vice also leaves out the part of that abstract that notes that 19 of 50 large law enforcement agencies studied used psychics. Vice simply says that most organizations don't use psychics, and I, I just don't like the framing. I don't trust Vice. You shouldn't trust Vice. This is not an agenda thing. This is a Vice writes to give you... The, Vi when Vice writes an article, it used to be that Vice did hard-hitting documentaries on the ground documenting the Ukraine Civil War. Now Vice is BuzzFeed. They write clickbait. But I will say they are very diligent about their clickbait and they write very long-winded clickbait. So it's useful for research purposes if you're trying to figure out what somebody's saying. But the important part here is that the paper's conclusion, and this kind of, I'm not saying that this vindicates OUR using a psychic, nor does it vindicate Vice criticizing them for using a psychic. But what it does say is that there's really no conclusion on the effectiveness of psychics. We have actually talked about a psychic being used in an investigation on this channel. It was in the Boy in the Box case, if you want to go check that video out. In that, it the psychic was interesting in that there was some stuff that she was able to pick up on that she probably shouldn't have. But at the same time, she also didn't lead anywhere anybody anywhere useful. But yeah, Vice frames the paper as concluding that psychics are ineffective. And I'm not telling you psychics are effective, but I am telling you Vice lied to you. 
The paper comes to no conclusion, at least the abstract, which I know Vice didn't read the paper either. Vice also criticizes Ballard for not operating tactically and bringing camera crews around, suggesting that he's doing this all for the, the fame and the glory of documenting these. Of course, on Ballard's end, he says they document it to prove it's happening and to be able to show people that yes, your donations are making a difference. You can choose to believe either one of them, I'm not going to tell you which. In my opinion, it is a valid criticism to say that bringing these camera crews along can make it harder to work a little bit more low-key and to, to pull one over on people. It might make people uncomfortable, might even scare people. So yeah, I can see where the criticism is there, but I think that by Vice making it about Tim's ego rather than, you know, basically what Tim said it was about, I think that's going a bridge too far. I think that they don't have the evidence to really back that up. So yes, it's fair to say that that is probably not the best tactic, but I don't think it's fair to say that it's an ego thing. The Vice article makes a number of other allegations and references another article of theirs, which is on OUR's habit of exaggerating, as they say. The Washington Post writes of that specific Vice article in 2020 that it found no clear falsehoods in Operation Underground Railroad's rescue claims, but Vice alleged a pattern of image burnishing and mythology building, a series of exaggerations which are, in aggregate, misleading. So again, Vice said that they found no clear falsehoods in OUR's accounts of their operations, but that there was embellishment and exaggeration. But you might be asking, what kind of embellishment or exaggeration? What specifically happened here? According to Vice, Ballard claims that Operation Underground Railroad played a large and central role in a major New York State trafficking case, but Vice says that Operation Underground Railroad doesn't seem to have been involved and that the girl that is repeatedly referenced by OUR escaped on her own and that OUR was not involved. Vice claims to have identified the real case of a girl who goes by the pseudonym Liliana, but they chose not to link to the case because they were worried about her privacy and they didn't want to expose it. Of course, Liliana's case has been talked about in front of Congress an entire year before any of this happened, but the exact case number was not mentioned. Now, again, I'm trying not to engage in any assumptions here, but if I were the one writing the article, I would have provided the case. I would have given you the case so you could form your own opinion instead of telling you what the case records said. They do quote some of her testimony, which includes that she was trafficked out of Mexico at the age of 14 by her boyfriend, who upon reaching New York began selling her to other men. In Tim Ballard's account of this case, she was younger when she began being groomed for trafficking, which again, without the actual case details, working only with pseudonyms, I was not able to find out which case it was, I was not able to access the case records. So I can only work with what they have here and what Tim said, which is frustrating because now I'm basically going with hearsay from two different sides. According to Vice, at the age of 17, she one day called a cab, told her captors she was going to visit family, and then left, never to return. But Vice did something a little weird here, which is they quote Liliana herself a whole bunch of times, and then that specific one explaining how she escaped, they quoted somebody else, another victim from the same trafficking ring. Again, because Vice didn't link to the story, Liliana is a pseudonym, and I'm not even entirely sure what district the case was in, I could not find the actual records. However, that little bit, that, that tiny shred of evidence that another victim said she called a cab and escaped that way, that is the only evidence that OUR was not in any way involved with this case at all. The thing is, Tim Ballard never said that they rescued Liliana. He simply said that they helped her and that she was in their care. While testifying in 2019 before Congress, Tim did tell a version of Liliana's story, which differs slightly from the Vice account. Again, don't have access to the records myself, but in that story, he references Liliana as a survivor. He does not reference her as somebody that Operation Underground Railroad rescued. I actually didn't find any examples of him referencing her as somebody that Operation Underground Railroad rescued. They seem to explicitly have said, she's a survivor and she's in our care. Maybe they did get in contact with her. Maybe they did tell her what she needed to do to escape. Maybe she rendezvoused with one of their teams somewhere. I can't tell because Vice didn't give me the article. They didn't give me the case. Additionally, Tim Ballard's testimony when he does mention Liliana wasn't about stuff that was going on in New York. It was about trafficking at the border. So he was more telling her story in relation to how it had to do with her being trafficked out of Central America into the United States. So it's a weird time to bring this up. He does mention her in a 2019 op-ed in Fox News where he said that he helped her escape her hell. Not that he helped her, but Operation Underground Railroad helped her. And this was the quote, escape 
escape her hell. But again, no mention of rescue there. So is Tim being vague? Yes. Were his testimony and the op-ed written at a time when she was actively involved in a court case and he had to be vague by necessity because he couldn't comment on an active court case in detail? Also, yes. And this is something I have I have experience with. There are a few different cases that we've worked on that were active cases. Well, probably the most famous one that we've talked about is the Gabby Petito case, which we have a direct line to Gabby Petito's family. We have been the first point of contact. We have been there for them, with them, since she first went missing, and there are still things they can't tell me. Additionally, in that op-ed, he revises what he has said in the past about the Buchanan incident, because he says that it was Customs and Border Patrol that snag Buchanan, and he does not take credit. He also doesn't say he was immediately on scene. And again, I want to preface what I am about to say by telling you guys I am not taking sides here, I'm trying to give you the truth. Vice is being dishonest in their article, and it's not the, it's not blatant lies, it's not the kind of thing where they're telling you something happened that simply didn't, it's the kind of journalistic dishonesty, where you, you bury the lead, or you find a way to say what you want people to think without technically lying, but you're, you're, you're not presenting the truth, you know, you know what I mean? Lying by omission and such. They spend the entire article saying that Operation Underground Railroad didn't do anything for Liliana, only to mention in in the 45th paragraph that they actually have no information on whether OUR was involved or not. They couldn't, they just don't know. Quoting the Vice article, a spokesperson for the U.S. Attorney's Office and lawyers involved in it declined to comment to Vice, and it remains unclear how OUR was associated with the case. So Vice spent 44 paragraphs telling you that OUR was not involved in the Liliana case, only to tell you in the 45th one that they actually don't know if OUR was involved in the Liliana case. Aiden, as a former journalism major, how does that make you feel? Not great. Exactly. They go on to say, what is clear is that OUR's interactions with private and public infrastructure have left no discernible trace. Now, of course, if your goal as an organization is to do undercover busts, that would make sense. That said, if OUR is going to take credit for aspects of these cases, I would expect them to eventually come forward and say what they did, at least so long as it doesn't endanger the victim, the survivor themselves. So, yes, there is room for OUR to be more transparent here. I will 100% endorse that and say yes, these organizations probably should be more transparent when possible. But again, I'm not on the inside, so maybe there was a reason they weren't in this specific case. Also, this article came out in 2020 when the Liliana case was had just finished and wrapped up. So hard to say exactly what was going on here, exactly who had access to what information. Vice then goes on to frame comments from other experts as refuting things OUR has said or done, but those experts actually say, and Vice quotes them as saying, that they're unfamiliar with OUR's work. So essentially they're saying because these other organizations don't know what Operation Underground Railroad does, and they're not connected to them, well, they, they must not be valid. They must not be a real organization. They're scamming you. The article suggests that Vice went to experts and said, here's what Operation Underground Railroad does. The experts said, well, that's not really how that works. And who knows if Vice adequately described what Operation Underground Railroad does. And again, I'm not saying this because I, I want you guys to distrust the Vice article. I'm linking you the Vice article so you can go read it yourselves. In my opinion, the Vice article is garbage. They do exactly what they accuse Operation Underground Railroad of doing, which is they paint a narrative for you. They don't adequately go into, you know, here's the pro, here's the con, here's the for, here's the against. They just tell you what they want you to think, and they only provide you with just enough evidence from their sources to make you agree with them. That's why I went back and everything that they cited, I read it myself, and time and time again, without fail, what I found is that Vice misrepresented their sources. But again, don't take my word for it. The article is linked in the description. Go read it. And one of the experts, who I'm not, I'm not trying to badmouth her, I just think that Vice was doing the wrong thing in including this. It's a semantic argument that gets brought up. It's a, it's a legitimate fallacy. They quote Anita Teeker of Safe Horizon saying, no one will say they're caring for someone, they'll reference cases, which of course Ballard said she's in our care, but it was an active case when he said that. So did Vice not tell them that? Did Anita Teeker not know that? Did she not realize that? Is this just a semantic argument for the sake of making a semantic argument to derail the conversation? I don't know, but because it's Vice, I'm gonna assume this is all on Vice. But my issue with that specific quote being included is that it's not addressing Ballard's actions, it's addressing Ballard's words describing his actions. Teeker also said that the Office of Refugee Resettlement would usually have a hand in caring for somebody like Liliana, but again, 
Vice didn't provide any information on how OUR was associated with the case, and nobody wanted to talk to Vice. The, the law enforcement, the attorney general, the lawyers involved in the case didn't want to talk to Vice, so instead of Vice just being honest and saying, sorry guys, we don't know what to tell you here, they decided to write the article anyway. And largely left out of all of this is the fact that Tim Ballard was on Trump's anti-trafficking council. So he probably had a, a good amount of weight to throw around. All of Vice's criticism in the article boil down at their core when you go back and you read their sources as well to, well, Operation Underground Railroad doesn't work for the people we like, so they must be bad. And I'm not just saying that, I'm gonna quote them for you. The seeming near complete lack of ties between OUR and the established network doing the difficult work of serving survivors of trafficking in New York specifically and the US generally does not suggest that it did not provide Liliana with valuable support. What it does suggest is that the group has few relationships with the people and institutions who do the work and little engagement with their normal processes. So to reiterate, the fact that Operation Underground Railroad does not work within the established network of resources, in Vice's own words, does not mean that they were not involved in Liliana's case. And again, in their own words, what it does suggest is that the group has few relationships with the people and institutions who do this work and little engagement with their normal processes. And that is buried in the 57th paragraph of an article entitled, A Famed Anti-Sex Trafficking Group Has a Problem with the Truth. Do you see the irony? But within the article, still the same Vice article, we're then on to how Tim's work causes trauma to survivors. Thing is, they don't actually talk about Operation Underground Railroad and Tim Ballard here. Instead, they compare Operation Underground Railroad to International Justice Mission. They then go on to talk about the ways that International Justice Mission has screwed up without ever mentioning a single time OUR did. The two are not the same organization, the two are not run by the same people, and the two don't even have the same exact tactics. They have worked together on, I think, two or three missions, but this this is an article about Operation Underground Railroad, and they're just saying, well, Operation Underground Railroad's tactics are similar to people who have done bad things, which means that Operation Underground Railroad is also doing bad things, but they provide no evidence that Operation Underground Railroad actually did traumatize anybody, at least Vice doesn't. To back up this claim, they link to another Vice article entitled, Anti-Trafficking Charity OUR Has Another Murky Rescue Story. But in the 12th paragraph of that article, it's admitted that the murky rescue story is true. They then admit they have no further details, make a bunch of assumptions, and levy some attacks against Tim Ballard and Tony Robbins, who provided his plane for the operation. Vice then goes on to look at Ballard and the other executives at OUR's salaries. In 2018, the year they chose, Ballard was paid $343,000, with his other executives making between $100,000 and $180,000. According to Tim Ballard, his high salary was to handle personal security, and OUR said that it was best if he purchased that himself. I don't have any information to the contrary, nor was any provided. Then in 2019, Ballard was paid just $106,000. As for expenditures, the organization raised $17 million in 2018, spending $924,000 of it on salaries for top staff, $1 million on office expenses, and then Vice gets a little bit less specific about how much money was spent where. They don't tell us how much was spent overall versus how much was retained overall, but they do tell us that $363,000 went to grants, and to quote, other funds were spent overseas, the bulk in the Middle East, more than $2 million, and a smaller amount in Central America and the Caribbean, $908,000. Vice does not expand on whether or not the other millions of dollars were spent, or how they were spent if they were. As recently as 2020, there were also several for-profit organizations that were organized as subsidiaries of Operation Underground Railroad. Namely, those organizations are Glenn Beck's Nazarene Fund, security company Deacon Incorporated, and Underground CrossFit LLC, which is a CrossFit gym, obviously. Nazarene Fund's mission is to help Christians and other religious minorities abroad escape religious persecution. Of course, Christianity is the dominant religion in the West, but it is not the dominant religion in Asia, the Middle East, and much of Africa. So there are a lot of places where being Christian is not super safe, but they also help with other religious minorities undergoing similar things elsewhere. As far as I can tell, Deacon Security seems to have been dissolved in 2020, and I'm not sure exactly what they ever did. My assumption is that they were attached to OUR as some sort of, like, 
PMC group maybe, so that they had a group that was registered in the proper way to go in and do paramilitary operations, but I don't know. Underground CrossFit has been renamed to CrossFit OUR, and 100% of profits from that organization go to Operation Underground Railroad. You can kind of think of it like running a bake sale or a car wash to finance your high school football team. And Catherine Ballard, Tim Ballard's wife, has also founded a charity called Children Need Families, and what they do is they give adoptive parents grants so that they can provide better for those kids. Often people can't adopt because they don't have the money to actually get the adoption going and get it completed. It's not inexpensive, it's not like adopting a dog. Adopting a child is a very difficult process, and sometimes you have good families that are, are loving that just can't afford to do it. So the organization helps those people, and they help kids who need to be adopted find families as well. All of these are LLCs, of course, which means that they're not 501c3 organizations, which is usually what a, a charity or, uh, you know, something that is a non-political action organization will be, because they have greater requirements for transparency. Instead, these are LLCs, and Vice says that LLCs are inferior to 501c3s for charities, but that's due to their beliefs on transparency rules. The fact of the matter is, there's a ton of 501c3 groups out there that absolutely abuse their status. For example, both PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, who kill so many animals each year and also pay all of their executives extremely high salaries through a sister organization that isn't a 501c3, that the 501c3 funnels money to, as well as Turning Point USA, which is an objectively partisan organization. They also are a 501c3 group, and they... They, are, they do politics, they just don't endorse specific candidates, which allows them to skirt the rules of 501c3 groups. So, to say that they're inferior because of transparency laws, look, it's all corrupt, everybody's lying. Vice also notes Ballard's commentary on that Wayfair conspiracy from a few years ago. Remember when we were all locked in our houses and paranoid about everything and we thought that Wayfair was selling kids in cabinets? They say that he had implicit support for that conspiracy theory. He's quoted by Vice as saying, With or without Wayfair, child trafficking is real and happening. Reports of child abuse cases are millions higher this year than they were last year. This is not a small thing or conspiracy theory. This is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. I want to reiterate what the first four words of that statement were. With or without Wayfair. Ballard also claimed that a lot of children are sold into trafficking via social media and various websites, which was confirmed by The Guardian. And when pressed about conspiracy theories related to his work and Sound of Freedom and Operation Underground Railroad by the New York Times, Ballard rightly pointed out that when you're as influential as he is, you, you have a lot of people who follow you and you cannot control what they say or do. Now, I have said in the past and I will say again, and I will even say that, you know what, maybe Tim Ballard does need to come out here and be a little bit more firm with his followers, as we have in the past, but when you are an influential person, when you do have a platform, you have a responsibility to, at the very least, tell your followers followers how you want, the, how you would like them to behave with certain things. So when we've gone after, you know, other content creators at times, like we were hard, we were hard on Mind Unveiled. But at no point did I tell my people, hey, go harass him. I said the opposite. I said, don't bother him. Let him dig a hole himself. He's going to fall right into it. And he did. But my point in saying that is not to brag about torching the Tartaria narrative. My point in saying that is Ballard could do more, but also... He, he isn't responsible for every single thing anybody says. He's just responsible to be a little bit more firm. Additionally, Operation Underground Railroad put out a statement saying that they did not support the Wayfair child trafficking conspiracy. They said they didn't think that that was a real thing. But... Regardless, Vice writes, Through seemingly giving credence to a theory that other reputable sources see as deeply far-fetched, OUR seems to have connected with a conspiracy-involved audience. But as we just displayed, they never endorsed the theory. And Vice's own quotes from their own article show that they never endorsed the theory. They basically took Tim saying, yeah, whether or not this is true, this is a problem elsewhere, child trafficking does exist, and they were like, well, that's him implicitly supporting the conspiracy theory, clearly. Next up is Operation Net Nanny, which was a Washington State Patrol program that was set up with the help of Operation Underground Railroad and achieved a 97% conviction rate. That was specifically targeting online predators. In 2020, the Washington State Patrol decided to sever ties with Operation Underground Railroad, claiming both that they no longer needed their money and help, and also that they had received complaints about Operation Underground Railroad, and that they were going to be distancing themselves from them because they didn't want to be associated with any conspiracies, despite the fact that they did refer to, and I quote, child trafficking as a growing concern. 
The Washington State Police, of course, were on a list that was provided to Vice by OUR of organizations they had worked with in the past, specifically law enforcement organizations, groups that they had partnered with in some form or another. That was a 21 agency non-exhaustive list, and the reason that they said it was non-exhaustive was that they had confidentiality agreements with certain agencies. Some of these partnerships were as minor as providing funding to buy a new police dog, and others included hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants as well as training. Vice aggressively downplays the latter while really propping up the frequency of the former. And when I say Vice is being dishonest, that's what I mean. I mean what they emphasize, what they omit, they are not telling you, they might be giving you facts, but they're not telling you the truth. After listing a number of smaller donations, Vice does then show that, yes, they did donate $100,000 to the Ilias Foundation, but like, you know, that's, let's just bury that at the bottom, right? At this point, I'm really not even interested in defending Operation Underground Railroad in this segment. I'm just more having a good time pointing out how, how bad Vice is. Like, they deserve to go bankrupt. And they did. Also, for some reason, they note that about $25,000 of that money were used to purchase software from an Israeli corporation. I'm not sure why specifically noting the Israeli corporation was necessary. And then at the end, they present a paraphrased version of Tim's statements from a video in 2018, where he addressed some of these controversies. At the end, they present a paraphrase of a video from October 2020, where Tim Ballard addressed some of these claims. And then we're on to their final paragraph. Operation Underground Railroad wasn't built on partnerships or cultural sensitivity, leads the statement, with Vice saying that OUR promises that they and they alone are able to venture deep into the underground world of sex trafficking to rescue the women and girls held therein. Now, technically they say OUR and organizations like them think that, which is interesting considering that Tim Ballard left OUR just before the movie came out to found something else called the Spear Fund, which is dedicated to providing funding and resources to all anti-trafficking organizations, not just OUR. A lot of people phrase this as him being quietly pushed out of OUR or being fired or something like that. According to Tim, and if you look at their websites, he's still all over it, by the way, so I don't think that this was like an animosity thing. There's no evidence of that. Tim's story is, I left to found the Spear Fund so I could help all of the anti-trafficking organizations, not just represent one of them, and for some reason this is being portrayed as, oh no, no, he was fired. So him doing that in 2023 is pretty much in direct contrast with what Vice claims they were doing in 2020. I could find no evidence that OUR has ever intentionally conveyed the message that they are the only people who can fight this, and I also found no evidence that Tim Ballard was forced to leave OUR. The last thing they say is that OUR responded to a detailed list of questions, which Vice did not provide in the article, with a four-paragraph statement. Now, of course, without seeing the questions, I don't know whether the questions were important or not, whether they were f specious or not. Like, the fact that Vice has gone out of their way to prevent you from understanding anything about how they conducted this article is very telling to me. But I wasn't just going to use Vice because they're garbage, and obviously there's more sources that are probably better than them, but nobody is quite as, as uh, prolific at being garbage as Vice. So we looked at some others, for example, a Meg Connolly writing for Slate. Uh, she was involved in one of these jump teams, as Operation Underground Railroad calls them, the groups that go in and actually do these missions. She was brought on as a journalist. She was invited by Tim Ballard himself, and she went along. And according to her, she went along thinking, you know what, cool, I get to go document us rescuing some kids. However, in reading her article, it seems that Operation Underground Railroad did not properly prepare her for what was going to happen. She says that she was not aware that there would be men with guns storming in, that she would be arrested, that she would be forced to lay on the ground, that she was going to be in the same room as traffickers. She was not aware that all of this was going to happen, and so when it did happen, she was scared and she didn't really know what to do about it. She also notes that when she spoke to people at OUR who were doing fundraising, that they had very little detailed knowledge of how trafficking actually works. But is that, was she talking to Tim Ballard or was she talking to somebody they hired to man the phones to call and raise money? Because those are very different jobs, those are very different roles, and the people who are doing the fundraising calls usually aren't even all that associated with organizations. I have a buddy who used to do calls for Republican candidates to pitch Republican candidates for elections. Man's a Democrat. You just needed a job. She also says that she shared her story and the details with an expert who told her, quote, how wrong that was. To quote her, the research, I learned, tells us our 2014 raid was likely another childhood trauma for those 26 kids. She also links to a paper on JSTOR in which the authors conclude that the aftercare for trafficking victims, and I quote, is a new area that needs an evidence base from which policy and practice can be formed. So what they're saying is, 
this is not something we've figured out yet. She also references a report in Foreign Policy which found that the 26 girls that they did rescue on that raid ended up back on the streets because the organization that OUR partnered with to take care of them, to provide them with shelter, did not have the capacity to handle 26 of them and just released them. So here there is definitely an opportunity to criticize Operation Underground Railroad. They should have picked better partners. It's as simple as that. I, you know, I get it that there's only so much you can do. This was one of their earlier operations. It was in 2014, right when they were getting started. Maybe they didn't, you know, there's gonna be hiccups along the way, but still at the same time, if you did all of that work and all you managed to do was nab a few traffickers, you gotta revise your policies, you gotta change how you do things, and perhaps they have. I, I don't know, you know, I, I couldn't find an example of this happening again after 2014, but that is something that it's fair to criticize. They should have picked a better partner, and if they can't find partners, then they need to find a way to set up their own shelters. Another criticism I've seen a lot of is how trafficking is portrayed in the film, because it is made to seem like most trafficking is kids getting just kidnapped, picked up off out of their front yard, into a van, something like that. We all had the stranger danger stuff when we were kids, you know? It's depicted as being that in the movie, and while on Operation Underground Railroad and Angel Studios' websites, they do say say that that's not how most trafficking happens. That's just kind of the most, that's the kind of trafficking that really gets your attention. They do say that on those websites, but they, it doesn't say it in the movie at any point, and I can understand why that's a criticism as well. That seems fair to me. Yes, this might give people an inaccurate perception of how this problem happens, and if they aren't aware that there's also other kinds of trafficking, they might end up in a position where they don't recognize it for what it is because they're only looking for that really brazen, you know, somebody kidnapping somebody thing. In reality, the majority of trafficking happens with people who already know the victim. The, the victim knows the person who ends up trafficking them. Uh, not always, not all the time, and when I say most of the time, I really do mean over 50%, not like over 80%. Statistics are hard to come by, this is varied, it happens all over the world, and there's not a ton of good one-stop resources. I had to look at Department of Justice, I had to look at DHS, I had to look at a bunch of nonprofits. So when I get to the statistics in here, you'll probably see how many different sources I looked at. So what can we conclude based on the criticisms of OUR's operations and how they've responded to them and what I was able to dig up about evidence for those criticisms? Well, the following. Their tactics are sometimes too flashy, which will either frighten victims, cause them to feel like, you know, they're unsafe, or it might tip off the traffickers and give them time to escape. They have chosen poor partners for aftercare outside of the United States, which has allowed some of the victims to end up right back on the streets being trafficked again. In some cases, this does mean those victims being punished, either physically, mentally, or something happening to their families. They have exaggerated, they have embellished a little bit. Obviously, donors want to get those flashy stories about what their money went to, but not to the extent of outright lying. And again, to quote Vice themselves, Vice found no clear falsehoods in Operation Underground Railroad's rescue claims, but alleged a pattern of image burnishing and mythology building, a series of exaggerations which are in aggregate misleading. Another criticism that I found valid was that Sound of Freedom, the movie, doesn't do enough to address the issue, the broader issue of trafficking. On the one hand, it, it needed to be focused enough to be a consistent narrative piece, so you can only talk about so much in 90 to 120 minutes. That's fair. At the same time, there were places in the film where there could have been a couple of lines, there could have been something in the epilogue, Jim Caviezel could have said something, just there, there could have been more steps taken. Now, personally, for me, my opinion, this movie being out, people being aware of it, even the controversy it's caused, has created a national, even an international discussion about the severity, the problem of child trafficking. So, in my, again, in, in my opinion, and I understand why some people might not agree with this, and I respect that, but in my opinion, the net po there's a, this is a net positive. This movie has created public outcry for more to be done, it's created awareness, and it's led to people like me doing videos like this where we're, we're obviously going through the movie and, you know, digesting and dissecting what happened in it and what's real and what's fake and what's misleading and what's exaggerated, all of that. But also, we're about to get to the part of this video where I go over the statistics for you and I tell you, you know, what's going on and, and what you can do to help, how to recognize the signs of trafficking. So, if that 
if 100,000 people see this video, 100,000 people now know to recognize the signs of trafficking who might not have beforehand, and it's because Sound of Freedom came out and there was enough controversy that I ended up going to see it. Like, that's, that is what happened here. In my opinion, that's a net positive. But again, if you disagree, I respect that. I know that there's a lot of nuance to the reasons why people might not appreciate this film, and that almost everyone here is well-intentioned. So as long as we can all agree that this is a problem that needs to be addressed, that there are kids out there who are going through absolutely horrific abuse, then I think we can all come together, put aside our differences, and find a way to work to solve this issue together. Also, just to quickly address one other thing about allegations, uh, some of the articles mentioned that Operation Underground Railroad was under investigation in Utah. It was in 2020, but the investigation ended with no charges filed. But now we're on to the juice stuff. We're on to the, the QAnon ties, everybody. So let's dig in. And the reason I'm, I'm gonna dig into this one is because this was easily the most inflammatory criticism that I saw for Sound of Freedom. It was the one that got shared the most on my feeds and everything. It's the one I saw the most was, this movie is QAnon propaganda. So I decided, because I watched the movie, and there's nothing in the movie when you go to see it that looks to me to be QAnon propaganda. But first I should probably explain what QAnon propaganda is, because that's what Charles Bromesco, writing for The Guardian, said. He said it was a, a paranoid fantasy of QAnon propaganda. But before we dive into what his article says, let me explain to you briefly what QAnon is, just in case you're not familiar. The origins of this whole thing lie with a anonymous poster on 4chan who made a series of rather mundane predictions about stuff that was going to happen in politics, claiming to work for the White House. Some of them came true, but they weren't particularly, like, ridiculous things. It was stuff that anybody who had a working knowledge of the American government at the time would have been like, well, well yeah. Also, QAnon is, like, pretty much 2019 and 2020 is when that really hits the mainstream. This movie was finished before QAnon became a thing. But in mainstream parlance, when we talk about QAnon, what we're talking about is the belief that a cabal of Satan-worshipping elites run a child sex ring and are trying to control our politics and media. So that's the definition that the media is working with when they write that this is a QAnon conspiracy movie. There's more to QAnon than that. It's, it's, it's ridiculous stuff. I mean, it's just people... It, it, it's shit posting on 4chan, honestly, that's all it is. But a lot of people thought that it was real and that that was unfortunate. But let's, let's briefly intro you to Charles Bromesco's article for The Guardian. He opens by informing the reader that decent people who wish to live good, happy lives should not look up Sound of Freedom on Twitter. He then goes on to say that Sound of Freedom leads back to a more unsavory network of astroturfed boosterism among the far-right fringe, a constellation of paranoids now attempting to spin a cause celebre out of a movie with vaguely simpatico leanings. Which, word salad, Charles. Just say what you mean. You don't need to make yourself sound more intelligent. It's not working. There was no reason for you to use all of those words and to involve three different languages. Like, th this is not me. Th right now, I'm not attacking Charles Bromesco for writing an article attacking Sound of Freedom because, again, I think I've been critical of Sound of Freedom all video so far. But what I am attacking him for is just being a smarmy little asswipe. His next few lines claim that uh, the uninitiated may not pick up on the red yarn and corkboard subtext of the film, implying that it's full of QAnon dog whistles. But the thing is, um, I am initiated. I am aware of all of this. I, I was pretty involved in politics in college. I was around. I knew what was going on. I was in college for the entirety of the Trump administration. I remember all of this happening. I remember doing things like uh, boxing a neo-Nazi in college. I was around these people. I didn't like them, but I was around them, and I knew how they thought. If there's anybody who's going to be familiar familiar with what these dog whistles would be is this guy. Like, I, I literally, I, I antagonized neo-Nazis in college for fun. This was something I thought was fun to do. But obviously, Charles Bromesco, he's gonna give us, he's gonna give us the info. He's gonna tell us what the connections are. He's gonna elucidate for us so that all of us plebeians who are beneath his journalistic ivory tower so we can be enlightened, right? And I will say, as I get into this, there are some QAnon connections. He's just full of it. First, he questions Ballard's employment history. Is he, much like Q himself from 4chan, lying about his employment with the federal government just so people will believe him so that they'll buy into his conspiracy theories? Well, the answer is no, Charles, if you'd bothered to actually do any research instead of just writing out your ass like you always do. Uh, yeah, I read some of your other articles. 
Um, this is some really lame film reviews. But the point, the point here is, no, there's multiple records, including the ones from Damian Moore over at American Crime Journal, that prove that, yes, Tim Ballard worked for DHS. Now, the whole thing here is that DHS cannot say Tim Ballard worked for DHS without his express written consent due to confidentiality, but Tim has been very forthcoming that, yes, he worked for DHS. And the records show that Tim worked for DHS. So, why Charles Bromesco decided to write this without researching it, I don't know. He goes on to say that Sound of Freedom's anonymous rebels, in an unspecified regional conflict with no connection to the alleged Clinton crime family, are really a dog whistle. Nobody mentioned the Clintons in the movie. The Cl also, all of the alleged Clinton crime family conspiracies have nothing to do with cocaine dealers in Colombia. Like, nothing to do with QAnon here. Not remotely related. There are cocaine cartels in Colombia. That is a real thing. I'm not sure what this even is. His reasoning in the article is that because America is referred to in a title card for the film as being a hub for the $150 billion industry of sex trafficking, somehow this is related to the Clintons. But here's the thing. That $150 billion number, that's from DHS. That's not a conspiracy theory. That is the Department of Homeland Security saying this is $150 billion a year industry. He also writes that the religious dimension seldom extends beyond a God-fearing undertone. The movie's characters are based on real people who are Christians, so it does make sense that they would have some sort of expression of faith in the film. And the thing is about this article, throughout it, Bromesco makes sure to tell you that there is nothing clearly QAnon related, nothing objectively QAnon related in the film whatsoever. It's all coded language that you only pick up on if you're in the in-group. He says, the first rule of QAnon is that you don't talk about QAnon where the normals can hear you. The thing is, all of the QAnon stuff that he's talking about is not in the film. There are no mentions of elite pedophiles, political parties, adrenochrome, spirit cooking, Pizzagate, or anything else QAnon related in the film, which is why he can't actually give you a single example. Instead, he set out to make to give you a reason to not watch this movie because he didn't want you to watch the movie. But it, it, these accusations have to be coming from somewhere, right? Like, he's got to have some reason to call it that. He does. And I'll give him credit here that there is a thread of truth in this article about QAnon, but it is not nearly to the extent that he has made it out to be. And again, if you want to fact check me, I have included the article in the description for you. I do not want you guys to take what I'm saying as simple fact. These are my opinions based on the facts I've presented to you. And again, if you disagree with me, I understand and I respect it. That is entirely your prerogative. I do not assume, like, and, and I will admit that when it first came out and I first saw it, my opinion was if you are against this movie, you are in favor of pedophilia. I have changed from that perspective. My belief is now, if you are against this movie, there are some legitimate reasons and I can understand and I can respect that. But the connections aren't in the movie itself. The connections are with the people who made the movie. Ballard himself is not in any way that I could find linked to the QAnon conspiracy. He doesn't seem to have ever espoused any beliefs from the QAnon conspiracy. And in a number of occasions, he's actually rejected things from the QAnon conspiracy on camera. The one thing I could find was that Wayfair conspiracy, but again, he did not endorse that. And it also was not a QAnon conspiracy. That was viral. That was all over the internet. That was not just far right. That was, that was all sorts of people. Ballard was not all in on it. He said that law enforcement would get answers sooner or later. And he went and said that children are sold on social media and on, on websites. And of course, like I said, I went and I checked. The Guardian confirmed that. He goes on to say in a video that it got worse during COVID, during lockdown, because all anybody could do all day, all kids could do, was sit inside on their computers, on Instagram, on Facebook, on, you know, Pop Tropica. It doesn't really matter. There were kids sitting inside, they were on their computers more often than ever before, and so were the pedophiles who were sitting at home, also unable to go to work, on their computers all day. Ballard cites the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which if you look to the side of the screen right now, you'll notice that this video is a fundraiser for them. Uh, I wanna point out that if every single person who were to watch this video were to donate just $1 to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, given our average views, we would probably raise $125,000. Now, obviously, I don't expect everybody to do that, but if even 1% of the people who watch this video donate $10, we can still donate a lot of money to a very important cause. So, I'm, I'm personally going to be sending a donation to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, at the end of the year for $1,000, and if you guys would like to help me out with this fundraiser, then please donate there as well.
but not just using the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I also checked The Guardian, who agreed that 2021 was the worst year for child abuse material online uh, in, in ever. Now, Ballard does say that there were millions more reports of child abuse online in 2020 than in 2019. The Guardian report says it's hundreds of thousands more, but it seems like they're counting different things. It seems like Ballard is counting reports, and The Guardian is counting actual materials that were collected and uh, people who, who were distributing them. So different metrics here, but both showed a significant increase. And just to be sure, I did check the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children website, and there was a jump in reports from 16.9 million in 2019 to 21.7 million in 2020. I will be fully transparent, Tim Ballard did argue, did testify in front of Congress that a border wall would stop trafficking, or at least would diminish trafficking. I don't want to say he said it would stop it, he said it would diminish it, um, which is that is political that was a pretty major issue under the trump presidency so yes there that is a conservative political cause that he has used and part of the movie does take place at the mexican border it does not suggest that trafficking is going on in all sorts of places on the mexican border and it even does suggest that most of it happens at points of entry but his suggestion is that yes we we could diminish trafficking by building a wall i'm not commenting on my opinion on that because i honestly i the statistics don't make me think that a wall would make a huge difference, at least not a big enough difference for that. If, if, I don't think that trafficking is a good enough reason on its own to build that wall, as in it would not convince enough people to build that wall. Um, like I said, I'm really trying not to do politics in this video. I'm just trying to tell you what he said. He also claimed that 10,000 children are trafficked across the southern border into the U.S. every year to be sold for exploitation, and uh, that appears to be a conflation of of trafficking and sex trafficking statistics because it's definitely not 10,000 kids being trafficked into the United States, at least not, th there are not 10,000 kids recorded being trafficked into the United States. And I think when you're gonna make these claims, you should have solid concrete evidence for it. He didn't provide any, so I, I think it's fair to criticize him for that. According to the Department of Justice, between 14,500 people and 17,500 people are trafficked into the United States and when we say trafficked here, we're, we're talking specifically about people who are brought here against their will. We're not talking about people who hire coyotes to bring them into the United States. We're talking about people who are, who are being forced. Maybe Ballard is using the, the, what happens to a lot of these people who pay for the coyotes, but if that is what he was saying, he didn't elaborate on it enough. But the fact of the matter is, it's definitely not 10,000 kids being recorded trafficked into the United States each year for exploitation, especially because there's only about 15 to 18,000 people being trafficked into the U.S. each year. Internally, on the other hand, there are about 200,000 people, 200,000 children in the U.S. each year who are at risk for sex trafficking. And that source is also the Department of Justice. Think all told, trafficking is most common at points of entry, so you're gonna most often see it in California, Texas, New York, and Florida. Those trafficked are not always forced into sexual abuse, but according to the Customs and Border Patrol agencies, it's, it's about a quarter are children. Globally, of the 40 to 50 million people that are enslaved at any given time, yes, that's a huge number, I am aware, it was disturbing to me as well. But out of those people, about a fifth are sex slaves. So if we extrapolate those numbers, those global numbers to the United States, which again, is only, it's loose, but it's all I can really do given the numbers I have. If we extrapolate that, we're looking at like 1,500 to 3,000 kids who are being uh, exploited in that manner and being trafficked here. That is absolutely too many. 100%. I, I am disgusted. I am horrified. Tim Ballard should do more to give the most accurate statistics possible and a little less to kind of go for the, go for the throat and really reel people in because it does open up criticisms like this. So as for all the Q stuff, Tim Ballard seems like he's mostly just a typical Republican. I, I don't see any QAnon stuff. So what about Jim Caviezel, the guy portraying Ballard? Might be a different story there. Vermesco writes that Jim Caviezel saved all the QAnon stuff, not for the movie, but for the press, for the promotional stuff. 
he links to a Media Matters article, and then Media Matters links to an article in The Independent. I could have used the Media Matters article, but Media Matters is one of the most biased websites on the internet. It would be like me using Breitbart. The Independent quotes Caviezel as saying, We must fight for that authentic freedom and live, my friends. By God, we must live, and with the Holy Spirit as your shield and Christ as your sword, may you join St. Michael in defending God and sending Lucifer and his henchmen straight back to hell where they belong. Fiery! He ends by saying, the storm is upon us, which the Independent says is a QAnon motif. It is also a biblical motif, and Jim Caviezel is a devout Catholic, so I don't like, I, I don't like the way that the Independent portrayed this. I don't necessarily disagree with them that it might be a QAnon thing in this specific case, but I do think that being like, well, that's a QAnon motif and there's nothing else it could be. Come on, guys. It, it could have very easily been a reference to any number of storms in scripture. Half the speech is him preaching, basically. And I... I actually was not aware of this part of the QAnon thing, but apparently the QAnon people still refer to the storm as when Trump is going to come in and retake the White House and all of that and punish everybody. Uh, I remember Sidney Powell talking about a storm and all of that back during the, the election and the aftermath. Um, Sidney Powell never actually produced anything, so the whole thing was kind of a nothing burger. I thought that died out in 2021 but I guess not. The article also references spiritual warfare as if it's, uh, it says that it is the, the predecessor to QAnon and that for several decades people have been talking about spiritual warfare. Uh, spiritual war, and it calls, and the part that bugged me is it called spiritual warfare a delusion. And for me, again, as a Christian, spiritual warfare is something that I'm familiar with as a concept. And if you're an atheist or an agnostic or you weren't raised Christian, you, you might not quite get it and it might sound a little crazy to you, but I think journalists need to get a little bit better about recognizing when their opinion is based upon a lack of understanding rather than the insanity of others. Because again, spiritual warfare, the idea that the devil is fighting for your soul, as is Christ, that is, th that's very common to Christians. That's not out there and there are both very literal interpretations and very symbolic interpretations. So just I took issue with that in the Guardian article because I felt like it wasn't it, it wasn't a fair assessment of what spiritual warfare means. But Caviezel gave that speech at a conference called For God and Country, Patriot Double Down. And the conference does appear to have had a considerable amount of QAnon influencers. Caviezel gave his speech right before a major QAnon influencer, uh, Juan, o, Juan o Silvin or something like that. He gets on stage and he calls the speech historic and all that. It's some of the usual pageantry from some of these QAnon grifters. Personally, I think Jim Caviezel is a true believer in what the stuff he's talking about. Uh, the way he speaks about it, the passion, all of that. I think he's maybe been misled about some things, but I do think that his his position comes from one of genuine care and passion. Some of the other guys at the conference, I feel like were probably taking advantage of his good nature um, and a, a degree of perhaps naivete that he would possess. And I wasn't just going to sit here and read the little tiny quotation and just the very end of it that the, the Independent posted. No, I went and I found the full speech. It's on YouTube. If, if you look up Jim Caviezel's speech, Forgotten Country, Patriot Double Down, it will come up. It's 18 or so minutes. And I, the first eight minutes is really him talking about faith, Christianity, uh, his experience with uh, getting onto the Passion of the Christ and playing Jesus, all of that. And then he, he turns it to spiritual warfare. He quotes Pope John Paul II, as well as Ronald Reagan. And he quotes John Paul II on freedom. And he had said, freedom consists not in doing what we like, but in having the right to do what we ought. It's very Catholic. And then as for Reagan, Reagan, this is a time for choosing. There is not a man alive who would carelessly send another man's son to war. And so that's, that obviously, that is from the 1960s. That is Reagan talking about Vietnam. In this case, it's talking about sending another man's son into spiritual warfare. Caviezel is an actor. He's, he's a dramatist. This is what he does. The war Caviezel's talking about, he says we are in a war that must be won, and that war is against Satan and those who follow Satan. He includes sex trafficking victims as victims of this spiritual war, as victims of this evil, and I can see where the QAnon stuff could be pointed out there. I, I can see it. And in, in reading that, in watching the whole speech, I encourage you guys to go watch the speech, just so you know what he says, because so, obviously I'm not going to read the whole speech here. But if you go and you watch the speech and you read what he says, I, I think that there's, there's definitely some stuff in there that could mean pretty dark things that could be pretty bad. I do not know what Tim Ballard's intentions are. I can only guess. I would like to try and see the best in people. I, I would like to believe that Tim is not alluding to any specific group of people, 
that he is not saying, you know, there's there's one group of people responsible for this and you know who they are, like certain people do, and like a lot of the Q people do. Um, I, I recently became a victim of anti-Semitism, which was weird because I'm not Jewish, like 3.8% Jewish. And I had people attacking me for being Jewish in several of my videos and I was like, well, what is this? So, you know, I, I, I want to see the best in people, but having seen that, the fact that people are willing to go to such lengths to even accuse a white guy of being a fake Jew hiding a conspiracy just because they don't like what he's saying. It's a real problem. There's anti-Semitism out there. It's a real thing and it's it's vicious and there are a lot of people who say some really, really dark and evil things and that should not be tolerated. That should not be defended, you know? Um, so for me, it's my take on this. And again, form your own opinions. I'm just telling you what I believe so you know what I believe. I want you guys to take these the facts as you will and do your own research if you'd like to. Again, we've given you all of our sources. But for me, I think that for Caviezel, I think he's been misled by bad actors. I think he's a good man. I think he wants good things for people. I think he genuinely cares about this issue, but I think people are using his good nature and his position to their own benefit at his detriment, and that makes me sad. And then the other big QAnon claim is adrenochrome, which you might be familiar with. The concept of adrenochrome is that the, the nameless elites, they will kidnap children, torture them so their bodies produce adrenaline, extract their blood, and then inject it into themselves in order to rejuvenate themselves. And that's how celebrities and politicians and everybody stays young, you know? That's the idea, at least. I'm not telling you that's happening. I'm just saying that is the conspiracy theory. Jim Caviezel, wholesale, on interview, said he believes that happened. I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. That happened. I wish it didn't. I wish he hadn't fallen for it, but that did happen. Ballard, on the other hand, who's often also accused of believing in adrenochrome, has never come out and said he believes in adrenochrome. In fact, he's said that he doesn't believe in adrenochrome and that what he saw, what he did, was when he was working on some stuff in West Africa, he encountered some witch doctors doctors, this is again his story, I'm telling you what he said, he encountered some witch doctors who did do certain stuff like this, where, you know, they, they would torture people, children, and then extract their blood, and that it would be used in rituals or for rejuvenation, and that sometimes they would cut off certain body parts and hang them on top of tents for protection. I don't know if any of that is true. I was not the one in West Africa out in out in the jungle. He might have actually seen that. He might not have. I'm sorry if you guys hear thunder. It's thunderstorming right now. But I, I can't say for certain. I don't know. So, it, you know, is that true? I have no idea. Is it the adrenochrome conspiracy? No. And in my opinion, part of the reason for the prevalence of this theory of adrenochrome is that there are legitimate things out there. There's a, a tech billionaire named Brian Johnson who his 17 year old son stays in great shape and he also stays in great shape, but he does blood transfusions from his 17 year old son. He's in his forties and he's hoping that this keeps him young. Now, the FDA has said not to do that. They've said that doesn't work. Um, but the, the thing is, if the, FDA, if the FDA is saying, hey, don't, don't do young blood transfusions, that's what it's called, young blood transfusion. If they're saying don't do it, that means it happened enough times that they had to say don't do it. And that was in 2019 that they cautioned people against that. Does it work? Anyone's guess. Currently the research says probably not. But does it kinda sound like adrenochrome? Yeah. So you can see how one of those two things being a real practice fits in with the conspiracy theory version and then it's hard to tell what the difference is, where the facts end and the, the nonsense begins. Adrenochrome is a real compound, of course, and that does not help, but it's never shown rejuvenative properties, and the fact of the matter is, it was shown to have rejuvenative properties in a fictional movie, and then the internet ran with it. So as far as QAnon goes, there are some connections between Jim Caviezel and certain aspects of the QAnon conspiracy, but as for Ballard, there's really no evidence that he believes in this stuff. But now that we've gone over the film, the criticisms, I hope you feel that I've been fair. If I haven't been fair, I I'm sorry, I really did try. I've been looking at Aiden throughout this entire video going, hey, it's like, am I I, am I going too hard in one direction? Am I being honest? How do you feel about this? He's been checking me all along. So I, I really, I, I, I'm I, sorry to harp on it, but it is so important to me that you guys understand that this is a... Okay. That this is not a political thing, that this is not me trying to vindicate OUR or to demonize OUR or Tim Ballard. I really do just want to give you guys the most accurate information possible. So now we're moving on to the statistics and my recommendations for how you can help end human trafficking. 
all human trafficking, but of course we're still gonna be focusing on the child trafficking. Every year, between 600 and 800,000 people are trafficked across borders. 70% of them are women and 50% are children. According to US Customs and Border Patrol, there are at any given time 40 to 50 million people enslaved around the world, and at least 25% of them are children. Over half of them are in forced labor, the remainder in some form of forced marriage. Of those forced into sexual slavery, about 99% are women, and, uh, and women make up 58% of forced labor. And the majority of internationally trafficked people are trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation, according to the US State Department. The thing about trafficking is that it's a rather complex crime, and sometimes even victims aren't aware that they're being trafficked. Most victims are impoverished and financially dependent on their captors. The transactions often happen in public without anything immediately apparent to observers. Victims are often exploited in multiple ways. It won't just be sexual abuse. It won't just be physical mistreatment. They'll also be forced to work. And all of that comes from US Customs and Border Patrol's website. And the thing is, re recognizing trafficking can be difficult. It can be very hard because how are you gonna know as an outsider just on the street, you see somebody and uh, what sign is there? Even people you know, they're terrified often if they realize they're being trafficked. Some people are not even realizing they're being abused because they're just expecting it or they're used to it tragically. But if you are out and about and or you're talking to a friend or a family member and your intuition tells you something's not right here, there are signs that you can look for. So I pulled up some websites and I looked at some of the signs and here's what I came up with from the Department of Justice in the State Department. These are the questions, the things to consider when you see somebody and your, your, your intuition is like, something's going, something's wrong, alarm bells are going off. You're gonna ask yourself, does the person seem disconnected from family, friends, church, school, or other community organizations? Has a child stopped attending school? Has there been a sudden dramatic change in behavior? Is a juvenile engaged in commercial sex acts? Is the person disoriented, confused, or showing signs of physical or marital abuse? Does the person have bruises in varying states of healing? Is the person fearful or submissive? Does the person show signs that they've been deprived of food, sleep, water, or medical care? Is the person in the company of someone to whom he or she defers, or someone who seems to be in control of where they go, whom they talk to, etc. Does the person appear to have been coached on what to say? Is the person living in unsuitable conditions? Does the person lack personal belongings and appear to have an unstable living situation? Does the person have freedom of movement? Not all of these signs are always present, nor does one or two of the signs being present mean that somebody is being trafficked, and you should never approach somebody you believe to be a trafficking victim yourself with the intention of telling them you think they're a trafficking victim. You wanna find the proper people to do that and make the report. And so by keeping an eye out, by noticing these signs, you might be able to be the difference. You might be able to be the person that files that report that saves somebody's life, and that could really, really help somebody. You can also order the Blue Campaign Indicator Card through a link in the description. It's marked as a Blue Campaign Indicator Card. You can actually just print one out. It can go right in your wallet. When it comes to resources for child trafficking inside of the United States, we recommend the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, they have great statistics, they have good resources, and they have a cyber tip line if you ever are worried that somebody you know is in danger. According to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, in 2022, there were over 19,000 reports of children at risk for sex trafficking in the United States with runaways being at particular risk. They received 400 reports of runaways who are likely trafficked by gang members, and they believe that one in six of the approximately 25,000 children reported as runaways in 2022 were likely trafficked. Of children who run away from child welfare facilities like shelters and group homes, approximately 18% were probably trafficked. And they also highlight the different types of common sex trafficking for children. Before they highlight are pimp-controlled trafficking, familial trafficking, gang-controlled trafficking, and buyer per perpetrated trafficking. Pimp-controlled trafficking is when a child is trafficked by an adult man or woman to whom they are unrelated, who often develops an interpersonal relationship to be used in leverage in the exploitation. As leverage, sorry. Gang-controlled trafficking occurs when a child is trafficked by a gang member or the entire gang, typically via the gang using their organizational structure, violence, and networks to instill fear and loyalty into the victim. Again, there were 400 reports of that in 2022. Familial trafficking is when a family member or a close friend is the one trafficking the child, and buyer-perpetrated trafficking is when the person who is actually abusing the child uses either money, shelter, food, something the child needs to force them to stay with them so that they can continue exploiting the child. 
As for chapters themselves and the demographics, we looked to Alyssa Courier-Wheeler, who was writing in Anti-Trafficking Review, which is a peer-reviewed anti-trafficking journal. She found that of defendants since the year 2000, only nine entities have been charged. That means something that is not an individual, but a corporation, a union, a club, something like that. For the most part, almost all criminal charges for trafficking are leveled against individuals or small groups. That said, civil lawsuits against organizations for trafficking are still common. So that means that this, that this does happen often with organizations. It's just, it gets litigated at the civil level rather than the criminal level. The majority of defendants are natural persons rather than legal persons, which means that it doesn't include companies, it just includes individuals. The average defendant was a 36 year old men with 81 or 82% of all defendants being men. Interestingly enough, women are more likely to be defendants in forced labor cases than in sex trafficking cases, and they make up about 43% of defendants in forced labor trafficking. Since the year 2000, 55% of defendants have been U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents, with another 15% being foreign nationals. The remaining statistics weren't listed, and ethnic data is basically unavailable. It's not that it's not out there, it's just so limited and varying that it's not usable. Only about 5% of trafficking defendants were in any way involved with organized crime, which is, I think, you know, important because a lot of people have the idea that these are kids being kidnapped by cartels or gangs or organizations. For the most part, it is an individual or a few individuals trafficking somebody. Important to notice is that traffickers often already have a pre-existing relationship with the person of some kind, whether that be family, coworker, classmate. For example, in 2020, about 43% of sex trafficking defendants already knew the victim before trafficking them. Of those people, those the 43% who did know the victim beforehand, 31% knew at least one of their victims via social media, 21% as a spouse or partner, 13% as a migrant smuggler, 10% as a friend or classmate, and 7% as a drug dealer. As you can tell, those numbers are all over the place for all sorts of different connections. I will say one thing for which there's not a ton of data, but definitely does happen a lot, is abuse of women and children who are hiring coyotes to cross the border into the United States. Uh, those statistics often are not tracked because it's, it's illegal immigration. There's other things that they're tracking for that already, but the, the rate of abuse by coyotes in those situations is staggering. I just don't have the numbers because there's no reliable numbers for that. Of those who trafficked children specifically for sex, 55% of them were charged for crimes exclusively involving children, which means these were not pimps who were also selling of age prostitutes. These were, these were people who solely trafficked children. In 53% of cases filed, victim age was the sole reason that anything was filed at all. We definitely recommend reading the entire article from Alyssa Courier-Wheeler. Uh, it's in the description, just like everything else. But, you know, it's very enlightening. It goes into some details about other types of trafficking. You should definitely take a look at that one. So, as we come to the end of this video, as we reach the conclusion, the point where, you know, it's like, all right, I, at the end of the video, I usually have some way to tie it together. In this case, I, I've, I've said it a number of times the way I feel about this, which is, we can fight this, but we can't fight this if we're arguing over what the best organization is, or over whether or not a movie was perfectly accurate to real life. We can criticize those things and, and we can argue, but we need to put some of that stuff behind us. We need to come out of this controversy over this film united and strong and willing to actually do something. Willing, if, if all you can do is donate $10 to a charity that handles it, great. If you have the capability, if you have the resources to go and join one of these organizations, then awesome. If you, if you can do that, great. This is something that is so important. There are so many people that are suffering from this. And it's not something like, like hunger or disease where it's the environment that's doing it to you. It is your fellow human beings that are doing this to other people. And all of us individually might not be able to do much, but all of us individually at the same time, there's a good chance. I'm not saying that I expect you guys to quit your jobs tomorrow and go join Operation Underground Railroad on a jump team and go rescue kids in South America. Not telling you to do that. Not even telling you to go donate to Underground Railroad. In fact, I, I won't even recommend that you do that because you know what? I don't wanna tell you who to donate your money to. I don't wanna tell you what to do with it. If you think Operation Underground Railroad is good and you want them, do it. If you wanna do missing exploited children, do it. If you wanna do Safe Haven, do it. I don't see any way in which fighting trafficking is gonna make trafficking worse. Maybe I'm naive for that, but I, what I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry guys. I'm doing this video. This was hard. This was hard. I didn't, I worry that this is going to be seen as, as political 
I, I worry that I worry that I got something wrong. Um, but I think this is what I think I needed to do this. Um, I don't know that anybody else will. And maybe maybe I did a good job. Maybe I didn't. But I hope you guys all all feel the way I do, which is that something's got to be done. And yes, Tim Ballard exaggerated some stuff. Yes, OUR exaggerated some things. Yes, they've been a little shady about the, what the extension of their partnerships with law enforcement has been. They've made some mistakes when it comes to aftercare. There are plenty of legitimate criticisms for Operation Underground Railroad, and it is my hope that they will take those criticisms, those considerations, the valid ones, and that they will make the appropriate changes. There's also a, a significant degree of criticism that should go to the journalists, because Vice and The Guardian and Rolling Stone and all of these different articles, all these different news sites put out articles that seemed like they were more about trying to get people just to not watch this specific movie with a throwaway line at the end like, yeah, trafficking's bad, you should care, but also this movie's horrible. So that was that was rough for me to look at. Um, I, I, think, I think the vast majority of people are in agreement that this is an awful practice and it needs to end, and we're just having trouble figuring out how to come together and work together, and I will admit that I, I was part of that for a little, for a period where I was saying inflammatory things like anybody who disagrees with this movie is a pedophile, and I regret that. Um, I, I should have been more careful. I should have looked into it more. I should not have let my emotions uh, rule me so much regarding this movie and this this issue. I, I very, very, very strongly care about it. Um, and I'll admit, you know, that, that I let my, my emotions get the best of me and there were times when I said some stuff that was probably inappropriate and, and unfair to a lot of people about, about their opinions on this movie. But I hope you guys got something out of this. I hope that you understand why this is an issue, um, the scale of the issue, and that there are things you can do to fight it. So, you know, with, with all of that said, um, I, usually, I usually do a pitch here at the end for where else you can find us, how you can support our channel, all of that. Uh, I think for the most part, everybody seeing this video knows that. There's also, you know, we have a Patreon and we have merch and all those things. If you watch any of our other videos, we go through the whole spiel at the end. Um, but what's really important to me here is, is that you guys know what this is, know what's going on, and it would mean a lot to me if you if you went up to that little box on the side of the screen and donated a dollar. That's all I'm asking. Um, and you know, if you think we did a good job, if you think we were fair and even, please share this video. And uh, you know, hopefully we can spread some awareness about both the the criticisms, the things that got that were done right, and also looking at the. Uh, I'm sorry, just this has been a five hour video shoot, um, and a, a week of reading about just the, the, the worst stuff. Thank you guys. And I, I hope that, I hope we did right by you for this video. I, I really do. We don't want to mislead anybody. We, we just want to, we want to fight the good fight, and we hope you'll fight it with us. Once again, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.